Well, good morning again. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read from verses 1 through 13, and we're going to be thinking about standing fast in liberty. Standing fast in liberty. So, of course, you'll see where we get that title from in in verse 1. So, beginning in verse 1, he says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another." And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word, and we'll do so even now. Okay, so as we consider uh, chapter 5 together, we want to just remind ourselves that we're now entering into a new section in the book. So far, uh, we saw chapters 1 and 2 were very personal, where Paul defended his apostolic authority and uh, wanted to do that and the gospel that he preached because it was under attack. There were people saying that uh, he was inferior to the other apostles, that uh, his gospel wasn't one received from the 12. And so he has to defend that. And so it's very personal. Chapters 3 and 4 are doctrinal. And we've been looking at the doctrine of the ju of justification by faith. And he developed that doctrine very well in chapters 3 and 4. And now we move into the final section, which is what has been described as practical. And we want to look at Paul defending the life of Christian freedom. Again, because it's under attack. And it's true, in a sense, um, we, uh, we can see that perhaps even in Western civilization right now, that our freedoms are being eroded. <laughs> and uh, we, we it's a terrible thing. When you enjoy freedom, you don't want to give it up. You don't want to lose it. And so this chapter is talking about freedom that we have in Christ. And we don't want to lose that. And so he's encouraging uh, the Christians to stand fast. And so that's kind of the background. And so uh, it's going to describe liberty. Liberty is kind of a very important theme in chapter 5, uh, the liberty that they have in Christ. And of course, he's, he's taking up the idea of uh, the allegory that we saw in chapter 4, when he mentioned in chapter 4 about the, uh, the, the free woman and Jerusalem above, which is free. So he's been talking a lot about freedom as opposed to bondage or slavery. So he wants to just kind of take out from that allegory this idea of liberty and freedom and develop it further in this particular chapter. Now, this chapter divides up very nicely into two sections, verses 1 through 12 and verses 13 through 26. And both sections begin with the uh, appeal to, to liberty. So we, we have, for instance, as we already read in verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. 
And so the liberty where Christ has made us free. The second section begins again with this use of the word liberty. Verse 13, brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So the reference to liberty divides the chapter into two distinct sections. The first section is basically stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free. And the ground of this liberty, uh, which is really freedom from the claims of the law. So it's Christian liberty is freedom from the claims of the law. That's what he's talking about in verses 1 through 12. And the ground of our freedom uh, from the claims of the law is the work of Christ. And he's going to emphasize that. Christ's work has set us free. He became a curse for us. We, we're not under the law, that legal system anymore, with all its bondage, with all its uh, difficulties. Uh, we've been set free from that. And stand fast in that. Don't give an inch. So the first section, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Ground of that freedom is the work of Christ. Second section, 13 through 26, is this. Christian liberty is freedom to fulfill the requirements of the law. And so he's really, he's not t telling us that now we're free, we can live exactly as we please. But he's actually saying that there's actually a way that we can live a life of obedience to the Lord. And uh, it, this liberty, it, he, he tells us again, verse 13, you've been called to liberty, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And he's going to tell us actually if the first section, the ground of our freedom from the law, is uh, the the basis of the work of Christ, in this second section, 13 through 26, uh, the, the ground, in a sense, of our freedom to now obey the Lord and fulfill all his requirements is the power of the indwelling spirit. And we're going to see a lot of emphasis on the Holy Spirit and his work. We're going to think about walking in the Spirit, being led of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit in that second section that actually allows us to live a Christ-like life, life. And so, basically, in this chapter, the Christian life is described as a life apart from law. And we want to say this, a life apart from license, a life according to the Spirit, and a life of service. Let me say that again. Christian life is described in this chapter as a life apart from law, apart from license. Doesn't mean we're free to do whatever we want. A life according to the Spirit and a life of service to the one who has set us free. So that's kind of the, the overall picture. The liberty to which believers are called is, is definitely not a liberty that leads to license. And that's what Paul's opponents would charge. People who are legalists, they, they always insist that if, if, you, if you let people off the yoke of the law, well, they're going to just live how they please. You see, we need this these rules. We need these regulations. We need this legal restraint to keep us on the straight and narrow. And if you remove that, then people will do exactly how they please. And so he's telling us, no, this liberty that I'm speaking of, it doesn't lead to license, um, as the opponents would say, but rather a liberty that leads to mature responsibility and holiness before God through the power of the indwelling spirit. And the one thing legalists don't get and can't get is that God has made a provision so that we do not live a life of license, and that is he put his spirit within us when we believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And if we simply just yield to the indwelling heavenly guest, we will live a life that is Christ-like and pleasing to God. And the legalists just don't get that. Uh, they'd rather trust in rules and regulations than the power of the holy indweller. And of course, it's an insult to Christ and it's an insult to the holy indweller uh, to reject the Spirit of God as our means of living a pleasing life to God. And so what he's saying is this, do you want to lead a holy life? Then begin with the principles of faith and shun legalism. 
Holiness will never come as the result of someone insisting on adherence to either man-made or God-made regulations. Law doesn't produce holiness. It actually produces rebels. Legalism doesn't produce holiness. It actually produces rebels because we always find a way around the rules. And so a lot better way, a lot safer way, is to depend on the indwelling heavenly guests. So that's kind of the theme of the chapter. We just wanted to introduce that because it's very significant. But in verses 1 through 12, he starts out, freedom from the claims of the law. And he stands out with starts with this phrase, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So, First of all, notice the therefore. Stand fast, therefore. Again, it's a reference to what's gone before. Whenever you see the therefore, you have to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? It's always a connection with what's gone before. And previously, he's talked about this allegory, uh, and this allegory has referenced the fact that we're connected with the free woman and Jerusalem, which is above, which is free. We're not connected with the bondwoman. In fact, we're to cast out the bondwoman and her son. We don't want anything to do with that. And so the thought is we're called to freedom, not to bondage, not to slavery. We're connected with the free woman and Jerusalem, which is above, which is free. And so he says, stand fast. Now, it's interesting that there are, there are several exhortations in the word of God that tell us to stand fast. And it's a military terminology. The idea is don't give an inch. Uh, hold the line. Uh, the, the picture is this. The enemy wants to attack us. <laughs> and as he comes at us, uh, we must stand fast. We cannot budge. We cannot give an inch. We cannot yield. Don't give up the ground that we have in Christ. Enjoy our standing in the Lord Jesus. Don't don't budge. Don't give an inch. And so I want to just look at some of the references to this idea of stand fast. And maybe we should be affirming this more. Brethren, stand fast. Don't let anybody rob you of these great joys and liberties we have in the Lord Jesus. And so let's just look at some of them. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, because the enemy would always like to take ground back from us. Uh, the, 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 gr the glorious ground of freedom we have in Christ, he, he doesn't want us to enjoy it. He wants to take it back. And so 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, we're just looking at this phrase, stand fast, as it's used by Paul. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. And so, again, an appeal to stand fast in the faith, this this truth that has been delivered to us. The enemy wants to rob us of it. He wants to uh, attack us. Uh, but brethren, stand fast. Be like men, right? In other words, uh, in the battlefield, uh, when somebody's told to hold the line, they're told, play the man. <laughs> Quit ye like men. Be a man. Stand fast. Don't don't be a coward. Don't don't allow the enemy to intimidate you. You stand firm in that position you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the book of Philippians now. We're just uh, just enjoying this thought of standing fast. Philippians 1 and verse 27. He says for in, um, in verse 27, Only let your conversation, your manner of life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And again, it's this idea of military. Uh, Philippi was a, a, a Roman military colony. And so they would get this language. And so the idea is this, striving together like a military, we're, we're, to, we're standing fast for the faith of the gospel. It's under attack. Again, in Philippi, beware of dogs, beware of the circumcision, those that want to rob you of your liberty. Stand fast. Don't give an inch. Don't succumb to the the pressure of the legalists. You stand firm in your liberty. First Thessalonians, 
again, we're just enjoying, I hope we're enjoying this thought of standing fast. And uh, it says in First Thessalonians 3 and verse 8, it says, uh, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Again, the Thessalonica, uh, there was a great attack amongst the Christians. They were being persecuted. Uh, they were uh, under tremendous pressure for their faith. And he says, uh, it, Paul was concerned. How are they doing? He, he wanted to get back and see how they were doing. He couldn't. There were Satan had put roadblocks in his way. And so he he had sent uh, 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 those to, to represent him to find out how they were doing. And when the news came back that they were doing well, he says, now we live knowing you stand fast in the Lord. And isn't it good to, to hear of Christians who are still standing fast in the Lord, uh, despite persecution, despite difficulties, despite opposition. It's a wonderful thing. Or oh, how we need people in our day to stand fast. Second Thessalonians, again, chapter 2, verse 15. Again, we see, it says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word, orally, because these are the early days of the church, and they didn't have a big Bible at that time. New Testament was very small. So the things that they had been given orally through the teaching of the Apostle Paul when he was with them, hold fast to those things. And also, the, not just the traditions that you heard orally taught by us, but, but also our epistle, uh, the letter that uh, stand fast in these things, don't budge. And so, again, we just see this, this tremendous exhortation. Uh, back here in chapter 5, verse, verse 1, stand fast in the liberty. How do we do that? Cast out the bondwoman permanently. Liberty from the demands of the law, liberty of conscience from the dreadful struggle to keep the law. Stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And so on the one hand, there's this positive exaltation, stand fast, and then there's the negative side, and it says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And so now he wants to talk about uh, this, uh, this tendency to get entangled again. See, Christ made us free uh, from the law by being made a curse for us. That's the great theme of that justification by faith. Uh, chapter um, Galatians 3 in verse 13, a, a tremendous verse, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He fulfilled the law in all its requirements, and then he bore its judgment on our behalf. Christ made us free. Then don't dare go back and become entangled again. And this idea of entangled, you know, you, you can see somebody get gets caught up in something don't get caught up don't get like like somebody like what you see a, an insect get caught in a spider's web do not allow these legalist teachers to somehow spin a web and get you caught up so that you're actually in bondage and you're not enjoying the freedom the liberty wherewith christ has made you free don't be entangled again and again, uh, that, that idea of again, the word again, I want you to notice back in chapter 4, verse 9, he says, but now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? And so he's saying, don't, don't do that. Don't be entangled again. Don't get uh, kind of snared and tied up in this this legalistic bondage system. In fact, he calls it a yoke of bondage. And of course, it was a heavy yoke. Imagine an ox bowed down under a heavy yoke. That's the picture. And of course, uh, the Apostle Peter, uh, back in the book of Acts in chapter 15, I'd like to just read there, Acts 15, verse 10. We read, Paul, uh, Peter, using this very language, he says uh, in, in chapter 15, verse 10, Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? 
Peter said, it, that yoke, it was unbearable. We couldn't bear it. Our fathers couldn't bear it. It's a heavy yoke. Why would you want to voluntarily put yourself under that yoke? We don't want to put anybody under it, Peter says. And Paul says, don't get under that yoke. Stay free. Enjoy the freedom, the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. And so it was heavy. It was a heavy yoke because law demanded from man that which they could not supply. That's why it was a bondage thing, because it's it's putting people under a system they can't keep. It, it was it was asking them to do something that they couldn't do. The law was, as we know, we've said all along, it's holy, it's just, it's good. But the problem is not with the law. The problem is with man, man's inability to keep it. And so it certainly was bondage. Jewish teachers counted up to 613 commandments to keep the law of Moses. Even to remember them all <laughs> was a burden, never mind to keep them. Can you imagine trying to keep track of 16, 613 regulations? But you, can either keep, you can't keep it straight in your head, never mind, obey them. And so to remember them all was a burden, to keep them bordered on the impossible. Small wonder that Paul referred to subjecting oneself to them as entering into slavery. And so he says, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In fact, there's a much nicer yoke that we're to take upon us. And again, I'm reminded of the words in, the, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 11, where the Lord tells us he's got a better yoke to offer to the human race. In verse 28 of Matthew 11, um, he says, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. And you get the picture, you see. Uh, if, you, if you're if you yoked up with Christ, he's bearing all the weight. He kept the law perfectly. And then he became that curse for us in, in bearing the, the full brunt of the law. And so take my yoke upon you, he says. Uh, don't be entangled with this yoke of bondage, which is going back to the law, but instead... My my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to Christ. Let him be your all in all. And so verse 2, it says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So we want to just notice some of the, the financial terminology that he's using here. He's saying that if you do this, if you become entangled again with this yoke of bondage, um, it's not going to work out very well for you. And what he's saying is, first of all, it won't profit you anything, so you're not going to get any benefit out of it. And then the next verse he says, I testify again to every man, this is verse 3, that is circumcised, that he's a debtor to do the whole law. So not only are you not getting any profit, you're actually ending up in debt. <laughs> and so he's saying, uh, like, this doesn't make any sense. There's no way... This is going to be for your betterment. It's going to be for the worse. And so what Paul is, is condemning here is the theology of circumcision. I want you to understand this. So he says, behold, I, Paul, say unto you, if you be circumcised. Now, again, this is, we're not talking about a little ceremony for health reasons that is fairly common in the United States of America. That's not the thought here. Circumcision is basically putting yourself under the covenant of the law with all its demands. And so he's he's condemning the theology of circumcision, namely the theology that makes works necessary for salvation and seeks to establish conformity to some external standards of behavior as a mark of spirituality. Now notice he says, Behold, I, Paul, 
say unto you. Why does he say, I, Paul, say unto you? I want you to look at Philippians just for a second. And chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and I want you to notice something about Paul. He says in verse 4 and 5, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, he says, circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee. So when he says, I, Paul, he's, he's speaking as a man who himself was circumcised, just as circumcised as the false teachers. And what he's saying to them is that it's no longer necessary. I, Paul, a circumcised man, is telling you not to once again become entangled with the orca bondage by submitting yourself to circumcision as a theology. Uh, I'm saying it to you because I suppose we could say today, I have been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and I know it doesn't work. And so I, Paul, I'm telling you, don't go that way. Don't go that dire direction at all. As a circumcised as they were, uh, he states, no longer necessary. It will profit you nothing. Having received Christ, they, they themselves uh, had basically acknowledge they could do nothing to save themselves see that's that's the truth isn't it when you when a person comes to faith in the lord jesus they're coming to that place where they're saying i i've nowhere else to go i can't save myself i can't keep the law i can't do what god requires of me i, I my only hope is that Jesus died for me on Calvary's cross. That's the gospel in a nutshell, isn't it? It's coming to the end of ourselves and saying our only hope for eternity is the finished work of Christ. And so uh, they, they'd been at that place where they'd acknowledged there was nothing they could do to save themselves. And yet, if you take circumcision and all that it implies, you're now saying, I can save myself. I can do something. So you're saying receiving Christ was to no avail. And so he says, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You, you, you're saying um, that there's no finished work, that there's something I have to do. You're putting yourself back under this legal mindset. And so he says, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Again, just reminding them that it, to turn to the law, it ruins the whole concept of grace. It creates a, an entirely new obligation. A person is obligated to obey the whole law. The law is a unit, an indivisible whole. If a person puts himself under any part of it for justification, he is a debtor to the entire code with its requirements and its curse. It was a covenant sign of a nation who were back in Exodus 19, verse 8, had said this, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And so basically, you're aligning yourself with that nation and with that responsibility, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And so what he's telling us is circumcision had real doctrinal implications. It was a theological system. It was signing up, basically, uh, to obedience to the entire legal code of Moses and, of course, the impossibility of keeping it. So he says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. If the Galatians accepted circumcision as a necessary for salvation, they would be leaving the grace system for the Mosaic law system. To fall from grace, as seen by this context, is to fall into legalism. Or to put it another way, to choose legalism is to relinquish grace as the principle by which one desires to be related to God. Does it mean losing your salvation that's an impossibility somebody's saved they're saved but what you're saying is i want to deal with god on the basis of law rather than grace 
And that's a losing proposition. You're not going to benefit in any way in doing that. You're going to lose all the riches, the inheritance you have in Christ, uh, the, all the blessings of being in Christ. And so basically, uh, the fallen from grace means that those who seek to be justified by law or human works or merit of any kind have rejected grace as the principle of getting right with God. It's impossible to have both. There are not two ways of salvation. There are not two saviors. It's either law or grace. You can't receive Christ and add your own works. He is the all-sufficient savior. To add to him is to say that the grace of God and the work of Christ are not enough. And there's no greater insult to Christ than to become a legalist who embraces this mosaic code. And of course, tragically, if you think of it, much of today's religion is completely condemned because it's all based on the system of you living up to some kind of standard rather than trusting in the finished work of Christ. Or oh, it's so much better to relate to God on the basis of grace. I'm a guilty sinner. I deserve hell. I have a savior that loved me and gave himself for me. My trust is entirely the finished work of Christ, not in myself or my performance, but on himself and his work on Calvary. What a place to be. And why would anybody want to be entangled again with this system? I want to think in verses five and six about the expectation of faith and in verse uh, particularly verse 5, the expectation of faith, verse 6, the expression of faith. And so he says, for we, now I want you to notice that, that he's changed from ye to we. So notice the end of verse 4, he says, uh, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, <laughs> we're definitely not, we through the Spirit, right? So we're trusting in Christ, and one of the things that happens when a person trusts in the finished work of Christ is the Holy Spirit comes to live within that person. We, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, I want you to notice, we don't work for the hope of righteousness by faith. We wait. <laughs> and that big difference between working and waiting. We're just waiting. And the, the, the thought being this is that um, we've trusted Christ, we're declared righteous, and we have a glorious hope that one day we're going to be completely righteous. And we're waiting for that. <laughs> we, we often say we're waiting for the Lord, who's going to, Paul would use the language, change our vile body, make it like unto his glorious body. Uh, we're waiting uh, for our complete righteousness, where we will be completely righteous before God in every respect, because we're going to see him and we're going to be like him. And and so he, he just wants us to understand this. The Christian waits eagerly for the full realization of salvation. Righteousness brings with it a wonderful hope. He doesn't work for it. He waits for it. And so, again, this is going back to chapter 4, where he talks about us being sons of and heirs. Notice chapter 4, verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman. Don't be entangled with her again. Be, cast her out and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So, brethren, you are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. But notice it says, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So we're heirs, right? We're heirs with God through Christ. And he's, he's thinking about this idea of one day we're going to come into our full inheritance. We're going to be like Christ. We're going to be with Christ. And we're waiting for that. That's our expectation. That's our, we'd say, our blessed hope. I'm going to see him. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to be perfectly righteous. No sinning heart left, all changed, all transformed. And I'm waiting for that. And so that's the expectation of faith. And then he goes on in verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So now he's, he's coming to this idea of 
well, how does it all work then? Uh, how, how, how are we to live? If we're not going to be under law and rules and regulations, how does this, this new life in Christ express itself? I want you to notice, he says, in Christ Jesus, circumcision doesn't make any difference, not on circumcision, but faith. It's all based on faith, faith in what Christ has done for us. And that faith works itself out by love, expresses itself, if you like, through love. So salvation is by faith apart from works. But one of the results of it is that once we are saved by faith, love now begins to mark us. First of all, love for, for the Lord. We, that's the first thing. We love the one who's done so much for us. And because we love him so much, we don't want to do anything to hurt him. We want to please him because we love him. And so now this whole new idea of love comes into the picture because we've been loved, unworthy sinners, and now love begins to work itself out in our life. And so faith puts us in connection with the finished work of Christ, and the result of that is it works itself out through love. I want to just kind of talk a little bit about this thought of love in terms of sanctification and holiness. Um, and so uh, basically, uh, this Paul talks a lot about this in, in Romans. I was just reading this the other day in Romans chapter 13. I'd like us just to look there for a moment about love being the fulfilling of the law. Um, let's just go back there for a second. Romans 13. <clears throat> Let me see now. I'm looking at 14. That's why it's not reading right. Yeah, here we go. So chapter 13, um, he says in verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For thus, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And so what he's telling us is this. Instead of this legalism, which is the, the kind of basis of the whole yoke of bondage, now there's a whole new impetus. It's love. Love is the, the game changer. First of all, we are loved of God. And the more we comprehend that, the more we want to live to please this God and we want to do things that would never hurt him. And so our motivation, we love him because he first loved us. And of course, the Holy Spirit's given to us. Uh, and so he talks about verse 5, we through the Spirit. And of course, uh, Romans 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who was given to us. And so all of a sudden now, love becomes the principal thing, not law, but love. And as we saw there in Romans chapter 13, the law is fulfilled by love. <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole idea of the law. And so now we have this new capacity to love because the Spirit's given to us, because we know the love of God ourselves, and it suddenly worked out. It's interesting. Again, just want you to notice that in these few verses here, verse 5 and 6, we have three of the most beautiful graces that are often found together, faith, hope, and love. So we notice verse 5, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. And then it says, faith which works by love. And you see this lovely trilogy of graces together frequently in the New Testament, and they all work together beautifully. So let's just look again. First um, Corinthians chapter 13, 
the course, the very famous love chapter. But 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. And, of course, we find it elsewhere. We could look at Colossians 1, uh, verses 4 and 5. But I want you to see that often these three beautiful graces go together, and and rightly so. Um, through faith in the finished work of Christ, we have an eternal hope. And also the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. All of these things work beautifully together. So now from verse 7 through 12, we want to consider the effects of false teaching. The effects of false teaching. Notice verse 7. He says, You, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now, let me just get this picture here. Paul describes the Galatians Christian experience in terms of a race. And that's a common thing in scripture, isn't it? We're running a race and it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. <laughs> it, it, some of us are realizing that we've been on this in this race a long time. Right. And so we're, we're running a race. And here's the picture. Somebody's running a race and they're running well. And then somebody cuts in in front of them and causes them to stumble. That's the picture. You did run well. Who did hinder you? I remember uh, uh, often uh, thought of this, that I was uh, trying to catch a flight. I was actually in Mumbai in India, and I had a, a, a hand luggage bag that was full of my notes and books. It's like dragging a dead dog around with you is a really heavy thing. And I'm racing to the next gate to get my connecting flight. And I'm really getting a, a steam up. And somebody with another heavy dead dog bag came in front of me and I tripped and went down on my knees on this marble floor and boy, did that slow me down in the race. <laughs> Thankfully, I made my flight, but but that person cut in right in front of me and uh, I couldn't avoid it. And then I was there I was I was I was stumbled. <laughs> and so he, that's the picture he's giving here. These Galatians were running well. And then notice he says, who? Who was it that cut in on you? Who was it that that slowed your progress here? And so what we could say is, False teaching interrupts progress. They were running well. But a false teacher came in and he hindered their walk. He hindered their progress. He's, he's got them tied up now. They're bound up with this, this thought of legalism. They'd begun their race well, but someone had cut in on them, causing them to break stride and stumble. Though many false teachers were disturbing the Galatians, notice the singular pronoun, who, indicates the leader of the Judaizers was in view here. Who is this person that's causing you to stumble? And then he says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And so what these false teachers were doing, they were breaking in the path established by, by Paul, divine truth. We need to be aware how easy it is to be stumbled after a good start in the Christian life. There are many, uh, uh, a servant of God starts well, <laughs> but they don't always finish well. And oftentimes, because somebody brings some false teaching, gets them snared up, and they lose their usefulness. And they're, they're not running as well as they once did. And so it's good to ask ourselves, how am I doing in the race? Have I been stumbled by false teaching? As, as Have I been snared by legalism that stopped my progress for the Lord? Or, or something come in that's stopping me from really moving on with God uh, in the right direction? Notice he says in verse 8, he says, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. False teaching not only hinders our progress, it is inconsistent with our calling. 
Paul says, some, <clears throat> somebody who is trying to give you this false teaching, its origins do not lie, this false teaching, with the one who called you. The one who called the Galatians, obviously, is God, and he called them in grace through the gospel, and he doesn't amend his terms. How they were called in the first race was understanding the gospel in its simplicity, that there's nothing you can do to save yourself. There's only one savior. You must trust in Christ. This is how God called them through the preaching of the gospel, and, and God hasn't changed his terms. And so he says, this persuasion, this, this, uh, and of course, th these false teachers are very persuasive, but it's not from God. It's not consistent with the message you heard that, first of all, got your attention, that showed you needed a savior. And then he goes on and he talks about false teaching is invasive. Just in our area, uh, I just saw in the local paper that they were trying to get uh, certain trees, they were they had a buyback program. If you had certain trees in your yard, they'd give you a local tree instead because there are invasive species that have come into the Ozarks and they don't like it. Uh, and so uh, they, they, they have implications. Uh, they kill uh, some of the wildlife or whatever. And so he's, he's telling us here, uh, false teaching is, is an invasive species. It's really damaging. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And of course, he's talking about yeast. False teaching like yeast spreads and permeates and, and it's corrupting. Even though maybe it makes things look nice and appealing, it's actually a corrupting thing. And so he's indicating a very real danger. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, showing them that evil teaching, if not rejected fully, will give its character to the whole church. That's the idea of the whole lump, you see. If this teaching gets a hold, it will really affect the entire character of the whole assembly or the whole assemblies in Galatia. And so... This idea of leaven, the children of Israel were told um, during the time, same time frame as the Passover that uh, they had to remove leaven from their homes. And, uh, of course, today Jews have an interesting little ceremony that they'll sprinkle level leaven around different places and then they'll ceremonially go through their homes with a, a, a brush and a shovel and they'll, they'll remove the leaven. Uh, but the idea is that um, no, that corruption should be removed from the home. And the Lord Jesus talks about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And again, he's referring to their doctrine. Their doctrine is wrong. On the one hand, you've got legalism in the Pharisees and you've got liberalism in the Sadducees. <laughs> beware of the impact of both legalism and liberalism amongst the saints right watch out for false deep teaching both are wrong uh, legalism and liberalism are both wrong things how the church has been plagued with teachings that are not of god through the centuries either people bringing in legalism or people bringing in uh, uh, a, a liberalism that denies the fundamentals of the faith. And so watch out, he says, little leaven leavens the whole lump. It, it gives character to the whole church, to the whole meeting. But here's a very positive note, verse 10. He says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And so there's an optimistic expression here of Paul's confidence that the Galatians will return to the right mind. That this bewitching uh, spell that has been cast upon them, so to speak, their minds will clear through, perhaps through his epistle here. It's gonna, the Lord's going to use it to clear away the fog and bring them back to a right mind. And then he says, he's not only confident they'll get it, but he's also confident that the Lord will judge this false teacher. 
And notice he says, whoever he be indicates there's no respect to persons with God, no matter how exalted or influential the man or high sounding his claims were in the end, he would be dealt with by God. How comforting for us to know that God ultimately judges apostates. The false teachers will bear their judgment. And so he says, I have confidence in you through the Lord, confident in the Galatians, that you're not otherwise minded, that you're going to stay true to what you've been taught. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whoever he be. And then he, so false teaching incurs divine judgment. That's the thought of verse 10. God will judge these false teachers. And then in verse 11, false teaching invites popularity. Notice it says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. It seemed that Paul's opponents were claiming that Paul still advocated circumcision, possibly because, if you remember, he had circumcised Timothy in Acts 16, verse 3. It was true he had circumcised Timothy, a young man of mixed parentage. Remember, he had a Jewish mother, so that his witness in the gospel amongst Jews would be acceptable. But it was not imposing circumcision as necessary to salvation. He now refers to this charge questioning this. If it were really true, why was, that, was Paul still suffering persecution? It would stop immediately, because if you think about Paul's persecution, where did it come from? It came from the Judaizers. They were the ones that followed him, dogged his steps everywhere, that whipped up Gentile mobs against him. You go through the book of Acts. And so what he's saying is, um, you know, that false teaching is always popular. But the truth often is rejected and re receives persecution because of the offense of the cross. You see, he says, um, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The cross is a scandal on, <laughs> is a stumbling block. <laughs> uh, it's hard. You see, why is the cross so offensive to man? You see, to preach circumcision was to tell sinners they could save themselves. There was a possibility, you know, if they're good and if they follow the rules. To preach the cross was to declare a man's inability to save himself, asserting that only Christ could save him, and that through the cross. False teaching generally is much more palatable to the natural man than the truth of the gospel, because the truth of the gospel tells us there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And we desperately want to do something, right? We're works-orientated people. And so when we stand for the truth of God, it's never going to be popular. And it's going to result in persecution. And it is amazing. Uh, there's great tolerance in the world towards works religions. It's amazing how Islam gets a free pass all the time. <laughs> and yet the great offense in our society is the cross of Christ, because it's saying that man, with all his religions, can do nothing to save himself. Only Christ can save, and the world hates that. Well, he says in verse 12, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. <laughs> he wished that the Judaizers, who were so enthusiastic about circumcision, would go the whole way and castrate themselves perhaps result, resulting in physical impotence. And Paul's desire is that they should be unable to produce new converts. Now, that sounds very harsh, and we, our time has gone. We need to revisit that. But I want to just finish with a simple thought. If we were as concerned for God's church and God's word as Paul was, we would wish that false teachers might cease from the land. So stand fast, brethren, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Amen.